This is the mighty Vicens, the European bison, a gentle giant that for millennia roamed the forests and grasslands of Europe, only to then disappear completely from the wild at the start of the 20th century. But now, with the return of European wilderness, the bison is making a comeback as well. Their role as keystone species and ecosystem engineers have put them in high demand for rewilding projects, and they are being reintroduced all over the continent. However, it has not been without controversy or opposition, which is why in this video we want to take a look at their unique story, from their tragic historical decline to recent revival and the role they are playing in rewilding the landscape of present day Europe. And for that, well, I thought it would be best for me to go and visit one of the areas where they have been reintroduced. So I'm taking the train and then I'm meeting my friend Tom to take a ferry to the Danish island of Bornholm, where there is a small herd of bison. We got there in the evening, did some wild camping and somehow managed to leave our shoes outside on a stormy night. So while they dry and before we get going, let me start by telling you a bit more about the European bison. Many people are only familiar with the American bison, which in fact is very similar to its European cousin. However, the American bison is on average slightly heavier and favors grazing, while the European bison is slightly taller and in addition to grazing also browses trees and shrubs. An adult male can measure up to 2.9 meters in length, about 1.9 meters in height and weigh about 800 kilos. However, it is the comparatively smaller females that lead the herd by deciding where to graze with males having more of a satellite position, focused on protection. As keystone species and ecosystem engineers, they create habitats for a variety of species by browsing, grazing, trampling, and rolling on the ground and the undergrowth, as well as debarking and knocking down trees, and of course, the sheer scale of their dung. All of this activity allows for pioneer plants to settle in the newly opened areas, creating a biodiverse rich mosaic of habitats for various grasses and flowers, insects, small mammals, birds, and even other grazers. As me and Tom made our way into the 200 hectare bison enclosure, much of this was visible on the ground. And then a thought popped into my head. What are bison doing here in the middle of the Baltic? So I think it's time we answer that question by looking at the bizarre history of this species. Based on archeological evidence, we know that their historic range went from the north of Spain all the way to Western Siberia. We don't know their original population numbers as they were gradually wiped out over millennia by both human presence and gradual changes in the climate. But based on their large range, we can estimate them to have been at least in the hundreds of thousands, if not even millions. They were certainly abundant in Roman times, but by the 15th century, they were gone for much of their range so that by the start of the 20th century, only two populations remained, one in Poland, in Białowieża, and another one in the northern part of the Caucasus Mountains. In Białowieża, they managed to survive due to the protection of the Grand Dukes and Kings of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and later also by the protection of Russian Tsars. This was not a particularly inspired and selfless endeavor. They simply loved to hunt them and prohibited anyone else from doing so. In the Caucasus, they did not have this protection and probably survived due to the sheer remoteness of the population there. Then, during World War I, German troops shot 600 bison in Białowieża and they verged on the brink of extinction. The last wild Polish bison was killed in 1921 and the last wild bison was killed in the Western Caucasus in 1927, making the species extinct in the wild. By then, there were only about 50 individuals left scattered across various zoos. The International Society for the Preservation of the Wiesent was founded in 1923, and over the years it has had some dubious patrons, such as Hermann Göring, the second most powerful man in Hitler's Nazi Germany. Regardless of who was behind these efforts, they helped start a breeding program and led to the creation of the European Bison Pedigree Book, which has tracked every living bison since then. However, the real recovery story is a Polish one. And in 1952, after the success of the breeding program, the first two bison were released back into the wild forests of Białowieża, with the herd growing in size ever since. The speed of the recovery was steady, but never fast, so that by the start of this century, the numbers had only climbed to about 2,800 individuals. Compare that with the recovery of the American bison to about half a million, and it puts it into perspective. Since then, renewed interest in the species has meant that the growth rates of the overall population have increased to about 15% per year. This has been accomplished above all in Poland, but also by a network of small, ambitious projects, which receive Polish bison to start their own semi-wild herds. To date, they have been reintroduced to about 20 countries, which is how they eventually got to an island in the middle of the Baltic Sea. It's places like this one here in Bornholm that are the perfect example of how the European bison is being brought back 
with this network of small scale but really well linked projects. And these small scale projects help do a lot more than just spread and breed the bison. They can help educate people and get them excited about wilderness coming back. In my opinion, the European bison is one of the ultimate symbols of rewilding. Because in places like this one, where they have been reintroduced, everything just feels wilder. When you turn a corner in the trail, there's this excitement that suddenly there might be a bison there. And after a few hours of searching, we finally spotted something between the trees. It was really impressive to see this big animal simply standing there in the forest. I think the video doesn't do justice to their size, which is quite intimidating, and led me to think, well, hang on, am I in danger? I read a few papers on this, and I will share the details in a future video about the feasibility of large-scale reintroductions, but the main conclusion is that they are very safe. Much like other wildlife, all you need is to keep your distance, and try not to disturb them. In Bornholm, they recommend you keep 100 meters distance from the bison. Now, before we look at where the bison could expand to in the future, let's look at the current population. And for this, I decided to contact Yvonne, who is an ecologist we work with, that has coordinated bison projects in the Netherlands and is now helping monitor bison reintroduction in Spain. This year, we hope to see 10,000 European bison. Uh, but then again, uh, the war in Ukraine, there are some uh, bigger herds also, uh, well, at least used to live in Ukraine, but one of the places is Chernobyl. We don't know exactly what, what happened there with the bison or with any wildlife. So it's a bit difficult now to, well, in a few months we will hear like what, what are the indications. Uh, but otherwise, if that didn't interfere that much on the, at least on the bison perspective, then uh, probably we will have more than 10,000 living bison right now. And that is a big thing. Uh, and also the other great thing about that is that near to 7,000 of them are living in nature or semi-free. So where could things go from here? Well, the first natural place for the bison to expand to are the larger national parks and protected areas that are found within their historic range. A great example of this is a project run by our partners Carpathia in the Fagarash Mountains, where they are reintroducing bison directly into the wilderness with the hope of creating a large, self-sustaining population. I recently visited the area to check on the trees we've planted there this spring, and also to scope out a project to help fight poaching. A small side note that if you have no clue what I'm talking about, maybe check out our website at mossy.earth. We run a monthly membership that plants trees in places like the Carpathians, the Danube or Iceland, and also funds rewilding projects such as wetland restoration or wildlife reintroductions. We have a Discord, an app, and make videos here on YouTube about our projects. It's pretty cheap, but quite impactful. So if that sounds interesting to you, be sure to check it out. So Carpathia actually released the bison in an area where we planted trees in 2018. I saw their footprints everywhere, which was quite exciting. So while I was there, I also wanted to see the bison, of course. But that turned out to be more complicated than I thought. The story of my search there involves us walking around with a giant antenna, a bear doing its thing, trying to get some food, and of course, the herd of bison, which also happened to have a small calf. So this was quite an interesting experience, which I will cover in the next video in this series, when we talk about where the bison could spread to and whether it might come into conflict with humans. Back in Bornholm, me and Tom eventually found the majority of the herd. Along the way, we saw broken trees, dung, and plenty of open meadows, the classical signs of bison doing their thing. We even got to see these little birds pick their fur. What I really want to say with this video is that we should be proud of this animal and we should do everything we can to restore it to the landscape. I will add the next video here once it's released. But for now, if you're curious about rewilding, be sure to check out this video right here, where we are trying to bring back salmon in Scotland's rivers. Until next time. Cheers!